We'll get a handout to you this morning. Uh, we're kicking off a new series uh, entitled Confused. Uh, how many of you sometimes wake up confused? Well, we're not talking about that kind of confused this morning. We're talking about a different kind of confusing because we live in a culture and a society that um, is confusing. And all you need to do is turn on the television and uh, see that from one week to the next week, people are saying and yelling at each other, saying different things. Uh, one week, everything's okay, and it's the way it's supposed to be, and then the very next week, everybody has a hashtag saying how bad it is. And it seems like our society is moving around like a school of fish, uh, following the latest hashtag uh, on Twitter or on Facebook. And really, it, it's an illustration of a culture that is that has lost its moorings and that is thoroughly and completely confused. And uh, so this morning, we're going to be looking at what it means to be confused. I want to let you know this is a mini-series. We're going to do, we're going to have three topics that we're going to be covering over the next month, all right? And uh, over, the, over the month of May, we have uh, uh, two, one, two, three special speakers on Sunday morning. So you won't have to listen to me this month. Uh, you'll get to listen to some other evangelists and preachers. Uh, on Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. But in between when those people are speaking, we're going to be covering this topic on confusion. And uh, you can see May 6th, that's today. We're going to this morning be talking about gender identity in a confused culture. How many of you just got anxiety all of a sudden? We're going to talk about what? Uh, gender identity in a confused culture. Two weeks from now, we're going to look at the role of men and women in church. There seems to be some confusion about that. In fact, there's been a, a dust-up just recently, as in yesterday, about uh, the role of men and women in church. So we're going to cover, we're, you, you notice we're hitting all the hot topics, right? Uh, I'm not trying to drive you off. I'm just trying to help us all kind of get on the same page. Role of men and women in church. And the third topic we're going to cover is June 3rd, and uh, that topic is Christians and social justice of our culture uh, we have a lot of, uh, if you will, they call them social justice warriors, people that jump from one bandwagon to the next ba bandwagon with their hair on fire. And uh, some of those causes are good, and some of them are kind of nuts. And uh, we're going to talk about Christians and social justice, because what can happen is that uh, a, good social, uh, a, a good social concern can be ignored by Christians because of all the crazy people that are associated with it. And so we're going to look at Christianity and social justice. You guys excited about that? I know I am. So uh, come over the next uh, few weeks as we cover those topics. All right. And then after uh, June 3rd, we're going to look at, we're going to begin our summer series called At Work, How the Gospel Transforms My Work. Uh, this will be a summer series that will run throughout the entire summer, nine weeks uh, up to when school starts. And, uh, you know, God has something to say about your work ethic. The Lord has something to say, the Bible has something to say about uh, the way you conduct yourself, not just in church, but on Monday morning when you go to work. And I'll give you a little sneak preview. The person you are on Sunday morning should be the same person you are on, on Monday at 7.59 or 8.01 or whenever you show up to work. Same person. And so we're going to look at what it means, how the gospel uh, transforms um, our work. Uh, but again, this morning, what we're going to do is cover the topic of gender identity in a confused culture. Now, some of you might be asking the question, Pastor, why are we talking about this topic? This seems like it's just way out there, and I don't know that we should be talking about this. I want to give you three reasons why uh, we should be talking about this. Number one, uh, there is a powerful propaganda war in progress. Um, why we should be talking about this is because there is a powerful propaganda war that is in progress in our society. It's on the news. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, blatantly in your television shows. It's in your movie theaters. Things that were just a few years ago considered a taboo are now glorified and, if you will, shoved down your throat in all of the different mediums. Now, um, if you were to say that, in fact, maybe you have had someone say, you know what, you're just a conspiracy theorist with all this stuff. Uh, everything's just fine. You Christians are just kind of nuts about, uh, about this whole thing, and you just need to shut your mouth and just go along with the flow. And, uh, you know, sometimes I am prone to 
conspiracy theories, as are we all, Area 51. We like a good conspiracy theory, but I will say that there is no conspiracy theory with regard to the powerful propaganda war that is in progress. This is an illustration of the kind of propaganda war that's taking place on, on Wikipedia. You can see uh, the title, I don't know if you can read this, but I'll read it for you. It says, Homosexual Agenda or Gay Agenda is a term introduced by sectors of the Christian right as a disparaging way to describe the advocacy of cultural acceptance and normalization of non-heterosexual orientations. You'll find as you study these that there are a whole lot of adjectives and nouns that they throw out at you. The advocacy of cultural acceptance and normalization of non-heterosexual orientations and relationships. The term refers to efforts to change government policies and laws on LGBT rights related issues. Additionally, it has been used by social conservatives and others to describe alleged goals of LGBT right activists, such as recruiting heterosexuals into what, is, what, is, uh, what, is, what they term a homosexual lifestyle. Now, do you, wiki is supposed to be the place where non-biased words are used. But if you look at this statement, you can see that there are a whole lot of biased words that are used. First, it says it's introduced by some sectors of Christianity. Uh, do you know, by and large, evangelicalism and Christianity in America has rejected this agenda. But if they can marginalize your thought and say you're just one of those subsectors of Christianity, then they can, uh, they can marginalize the way you think. It's an introduced by sectors of the Christian right. You know what Christian right means? It means that you are probably a racist and you have a Confederate flag in your back window. You probably have tons of AR-15s like under your bed. You, you guys are all loons when it comes to that. Christian right in a disparaging way to describe, notice the positive spin, the advocacy of cultural acceptance. It, you don't see that the Christian right is the advocacy of uh, traditional values. You see that Christianity is, uh, is uh, something that is disparaging uh, this movement. And I, and I bring this up to show you that uh, while you might be watching TV and you might be interacting with uh, teachers at school, and you might be looking at curriculum, and you might be wondering, is it just me? Am I the one that's nuts and everybody else is normal? I want you to know that you're not nuts. We're all normal. But what we see is a very strong uh, propaganda on television, on the internet, on social media, throughout books, and throughout any other kind of medium to change what was just recently considered a taboo into something that must be accepted. Now notice it says these are, these are terms introduced by the sectors of Christianity. Um, so I want you to know that Christianity is not the one that came up with uh, this thought that there is a, an agenda and this propaganda is being pushed into our laps. A book called After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s, lays out a blueprint. It says the main thing is to talk about gayness until the issue becomes thoroughly tiresome. How many of you are tired of talking about this? 3% of the population, and we're tired of talking about it. In the early stages of the campaign to reach straight America, the masses should not be shocked and repelled by premature exposure to homosexual behavior itself. Instead, the imagery of sex should be downplayed and gay rights should be reduced to an abstract social question as much as possible. All right, it's not a moral question, it's a social question. Continuing on, the average American watches over seven hours of TV a daily. Those hours open up a gateway into the private world of straits through which a Trojan horse might be passed. You, you see, this was written by a book. This was written by people that are saying this is our agenda. And, uh, and Wikipedia, among others, say you Christians are just nuts and you believe in conspiracies. Let me show you another quote. Is everybody okay? All right, let me show you one more quote. <clears throat> a media campaign uh, that casts gays as society's victims and encourages straights to, uh, to their protectors must make it easier for those who respond to assert and explain their new perspectives. Even when it sticks to facts, propaganda can be unabashedly subjected and one-sided. 
There's nothing necessarily wrong with this. Propaganda tells its own side of the story as moving and credibly as possible since it can count on its enemies to tell the other side with vengeance. In its battle for hearts and minds, effective pro- propaganda knows enough to put its best foot forward. This is what our media captain must do. And so, Christian, while, um, while it might be a difficult conversation for us to have in this room today, notice, know that there is a propaganda war on, the mind, on your mind and on the minds of your children to normalize something that has traditionally not been uh, considered normal. And, um, and so why we must talk about this is because children have been exposed. If your child attends, to a, attends a public school, uh, there's a, a, a great possibility that they have already been exposed to this mindset while they were, before they were even 10 years old. After 10, 11 years old, your, ch- your child has been exposed. There's, there's no way around it. This shows up in video games. It shows up in movies. It shows up in cartoons, just the subtle propaganda uh, that, uh, that illustrates the war that we are in. The second reason why we must talk about this, you can see in your notes, is because Christians are getting confused by the pace of change. Christians are getting confused by the pace of change. Um, those of us that find it hard to uh, speak through emotion know what this means. You see something on TV that illustrates the agenda, and then you throw your shoe at it, and then, then say really bad things to your children about homosexual activity. There are Christians who have, who have been so emotionally charged by the propaganda that they have gone so far to the other side as to say, you know what, if you ever become one of those, then I'll disown you, we'll never talk to you again. And you've gone way too far. There are some people that have said, you know, uh, if, you, uh, if you are a homosexual, you cannot be saved. You are headed for hell. And that's not true. Uh, some would say that um, uh, if you're a Christian, then you can't be a homosexual. If you're a homosexual, then that illustrates that you have been condemned and you no- are not a Christian. And that is not true. And in fact, we look at the Bible and we see a man, King David, who is of the lineage of of Jesus Christ, who coveted, lusted with his eyes, which is where all sexual sin begins. He coveted something that didn't belong to him. He committed adultery, and he committed murder. And that was a man who, was, uh, uh, who had faith in God. And, and so many times Christians, all of us, can become so emotive in discussing this that we go way too far and we marginalize the redeeming power of the Bible and of Jesus Christ. Because all sin is con- uh, condemnation worthy. In-, in God's eyes, your white lie is just as bad as somebody else's sexual sin. Both of those things have condemned you, and both of those things have proved that you are unrighteous and unable to get to, to heaven outside of Jesus Christ. And, and while those two can have, well, in, in, in reality, those two sins can have diametric, uh, can have really bad consequences, there's two, they're two, both are the same sins that Jesus Christ died for. And so Christians get confused at the pace of change. Um, let me illustrate how this is, how... Um, how Christians are getting influenced by this. Let me just show you two pictures real quick, all right? This is from the Roseanne show. This is a young boy. He's nine years old. And in this television show, he dresses like a girl, okay? How many of you know there's something wrong with that? There's something not right. Now, there's, I'm not saying that that boy, there's anything wrong with that boy, but powerful people who write scripts and are multimillionaires and know that they control the heartstrings of America are the ones that do these sorts of things. It leads to people like this. This is a 52-year-old man, seven children, who, as you can see, is dressing like a woman, with, uh, and, and he assumes that he is six years old. Okay? You see, this isn't normal. This is abnormal. This man has problems, 
And this is an affront to God. It's a sin. So Christians, why do we need to talk about this? Because there's a propaganda war in place. Number two, because Christians are getting confused at the pace of the change. Uh, Warren, uh, uh, Erwin Lutzer said the, the t- in his book, um, Uh, what brought down the German culture said this. He said, there are three ways in which uh, propagandists try to confuse a culture. Number one, by wearing out the opposition. Number two, by appealing to emotion. And number three, by portraying the cause as just and right. And I hope you see that that plays out on television. It's a, there's a cause that is right. People have been marginalized just like other people in the past, and we've got to do something about, the, about this. We've got, got to fix the problem because these people have been marginalized. There's a powerful propaganda that's taking place. And really, the question is, what defines truth? You can see three things in your notes, and I'll show, you, show it on the screen here today. What defines truth? There, there have been, uh, in the United States particularly, three uh, eras that we have gone through. First is the pre-modern era. Uh, you could consider this pre-1850 in America. Our culture and our values and what was described as truth was shaped by religion. Religion was the source of truth and reality. Fast forward to the modern era, this would be uh, the, time betw- the time around World War I and World War II, where, where uh, truth was determined by science. It was shaped by science. Science became the source of truth. In the 1960s and 1970s, you've heard this term, the postmodern era. That's the era in which we live. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, it, it came into fruition. Where, whereas truth was defined by religion in the past, and then it was determined by science in the past, now it's determined by individuals. In fact, the Bible illustrates this when the Bible says that every man did what was right in his eyes. And now the postmodern culture is all about a truth determined by the individual. And it's been redefined, it's redefining our reality. Very quickly, let me show you this. This is the way it goes in our mind. There's a self-generated reality. When, we, when we're redefining reality, we, we generate the reality in our own minds. We say, I am the creator of my own reality and my own morality is determined by me. It then becomes collective reality. We decide collectively what truth really looks like. And then eventually it becomes administrative reality where the general structure and the rules of society are reset and society, uh, as it is determined by, uh, as it is said by redefiningGod.com, society becomes a world run like an amusement park. If we break the rules, we get tossed out. And that's where we exist today. Something that just let us do our thing has now become, if you don't accept us, then, uh, then there are consequences. There's now a bill in the California legislature that would, that would uh, in a very real way, ban uh, a, a preaching from certain passages of the Bible. It would, in a very real way, ban certain kinds of books in Christian bookstores. You see, what was once like, guys, just leave us alone. Everything's okay. Just let us be who we are has now become this administrative reality that we are unfortunately all having to live through. So why must we talk about this? Because there's a powerful propaganda war. Because Christians are getting confused. And the the third reason why we must talk about this is because the Bible provides moral understanding for all humanity. Do you realize the Bible is not just a book that was written 2,000 years ago for people that don't exist anymore, but the Bible is a book that is written for you and me here today. Uh, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 3, 32, 4, He is the rock. He is, his, his work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. You see, Christian, the Bible gives us answers. We don't have to live in a postmodern world where there is no truth or where truth is simply defined by the individual because God has given us His truth. Now, I don't know where you are here today. 
I don't know uh, what you think about this matter. I don't know where you are personally in your identity on this matter. But I want to I maybe help you understand who you truly are. Now, please understand, this message, the, the remainder of this message would go against the bill in California. The remainder of this message is to say that you are not who you think you are, and your identity is not found in how you feel, but your identity is found in Jesus Christ who died for you, who created you, and who loves you. So let me give you this. I, 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 promise, to come, I promise to help you on this. Because I want all of us to understand who we are. You might not just have trouble with identity around this particular subject. You might have just a really hard time figuring out who you are. So let me help you find out who you are. Number one, who are you? Number one, it's all written in the personal because I want you to apply this. Number one, I was created in the image of God. I was created in the image of God. You understand that you are not like animals and other species in the environment. You're not, you're not just a glorified monkey. Uh, some of you might act like monkeys. I don't know. I have kids that act like monkeys, but, but that's not who we are. A, a man is different from the other points of creation. The Bible says in Genesis 1.26 that you were made differently from all of creation. You, you can see it in your notes. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You see by this passage that you were created in the very image of God. Spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically, you're, you're created in the image of God. It's an amazing thought when you realize that, that you are just not another person in the four billion people that live on earth. The Bible says in Psalms that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. The, the Bible says that before you were even formed in your mother's womb, that God knew you. The, the Bible says that the instruction book, I, I don't know, maybe the DNA, the instruction book of all of your appendages were written in a book way before you were conceived. God thought about you and knew you before you were ever created. Many problems with identity come when people are very nihilistic about who they are. They think that no one loves them, no one cares for them, everybody's out to get them, and they try, to, they try their best to find some kind of an affinity group that will love and accept them and pull them in and show them affection. I want you to know today that you were created in the image of God and you are loved by your Creator. And as Christians, we are commanded to love as Christ has loved others. And we love, we love you I know it sounds kind of trite to say that, but regardless of where you are in this particular topic, God loves you and we love you. We have to all come from the same perspective or the same point of view, that no one, that an honest, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian does not hate somebody because of their sexual orientation. They can hate the, they can hate the destructiveness of the sin. They can look at the culture that is, uh, that is, that is hurting a society and be, and be repulsed by that. But we are to love the sinner just, uh, we are to love the sinner just as God loved the sinner. Who am I? Number one, you were created in the image of God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no person that you can follow on Twitter that will make you feel more special than God and reading through his word. There's no amount of likes or hearts on your social page that will make you feel more accepted than when you read through the pages of scripture. You're made in the image of God. Number two, who are you? You're made in the image of God. Number two, I was created with a natural compass. Part of the, the fabric of humanity is that God has written his natural law upon our hearts. We've been on Wednesday nights going through the book of Romans. And Romans 1, we're not going to dig way deep into Romans 1, but Romans 1 illustrates that every person 
all of humanity has a natural compass, a conscience. We're all born with it. Look in Romans 2.14 in your notes. For when Gentiles, that's us, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things that are in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves. The, the passage here is saying that the Gentiles would be the ones that don't have the Old Testament, okay? The people that don't have the Old Testament, even though they don't have the Old Testament, they don't have the law, they're still fulfilling the moral obligations that are found within it. Here's why. In verse 15, it's underlined in your notes, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while, excusing, uh, while accusing or else excusing one another. The passage clearly says here that you were born in the image of your creator and you were born with a God conscience. You know innately what is right and what is wrong. There's probably very few cultures across, Amer across the world today where if we were to, uh, we were to show a video of, a, of an old, elderly lady getting pushed into a, a road that would say that that would be okay, right? It, it's written in our, in, our, in our DNA, within our conscience, that, we, uh, that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. Romans 1.19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. And so God has given us a conscience. We'll talk about how that conscience can be hardened here in a moment. But every hum human being has been given with a God conscience. That means that many times the guilt that you are feeling is not from external forces. It's not because of bad parents. It's not because of those white Christians. It's not because of what peop the way people look at you or what people say. It's written on your heart. And your heart bears witness of what is right and what is wrong. You were created with a natural compass. Every one of us have a God conscience. Every one of us have an understanding that there is a God that is much greater and bigger than we are, and that, that there are, there are, there's fundamental truths, there are rights and there are wrongs. In every culture, you'll find that there's this idea of right and wrong. Where, where did this come from? It, it came from the knowledge of God that has been written upon our hearts. Who are you? You're fearfully and wonderfully made, created by God and loved by your creator. Number two, you are created with a natural compass that is, to, that is to expose you to the God that created you. But number three, number three is really important. Number three, my conscience can be hardened by sin. My conscience can be hardened by sin. The more you push against your God conscience, the more calluses that you build up. The more times you push against what you know is right, the easier it becomes to do what is wrong. You've probably seen this illustrated in maybe not such a deep way, but uh, just in uh, breaking the speed limit. When you were 16 years old, uh, I, you were probably scared to death to go over the speed limit. When you saw a police officer, you probably reduced your miles per hour by 20. You wanted to make sure that you, that you followed the law and that you didn't violate the law. And I think that there's some of, you, some of you today that can get up to 75 and 80 miles an hour before you're even off the on-ramp. And it doesn't even affect you, right? You see, what happens is that our, our conscience can be uh, can, our conscience is exposed to the law and we are afraid to violate the law, but we can dull our conscience, we can harden our conscience just by willful, continual violation of it. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness who hold the truth in unrighteousness. These are people that know what is right but they hold it in unrighteousness. They, they go against their conscience. The, the passage continues in Romans to say that they willfully harden their heart the more they are exposed to what is true. And finally, the Bible says he delivers them over to their affections. Who are you? You're loved by your creator. 
You've been created with a natural compass. Within your own mind, within your own heart, you know what is right and what is wrong. But in continual violation of your conscience, you can allow it to become hardened. You'll find certain people who validate your belief system and your structure. You'll, you'll find people who, 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 um, uh, who will say that they accept you the way you are. In reality, what they're saying is they're not going to say anything about whether or not you're doing what's wrong. Your conscience can be hardened by sin. But the fourth thing I want you to see, the fourth thing is that God's word provides real resistance. God's word provides real resistance. The Bible says in James 4, 7, that we are to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion, uh, walking about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says that if we follow our, that our hearts can mislead us, our hearts can lead us astray. But with God's word and the truth that is revealed in his word, it provides real resistance against temptation and sin. God's word provides real resistance. And this is the part that is absolutely against the law to say. That you don't have to remain in your sin. That you don't have to follow your natural impulses. Um, all of us have natural impulses. You understand that, right? We have a natural impulse to break the law. We have a natural impulse to uh, do what's wrong and to try to get away from it. Every one of us have natural impulses. Just because your natural impulse seems to be a very popular today doesn't mean that it's right. Just because your uh, your impulse has hashtags and comfort groups all around it, doesn't mean that it is right. Who defines what is right? D does culture define it? D does the, uh, the talk show host define what is right? Who defines right? Is it a, a, a collective of people who all believe the same thing in this tribal way? Who defines what is right? Christian, the Bible defines what is right and wrong for not only Christians, but all of humanity. You see, the Bible is not a book to say, oh, well, that's good for you Christians. But I, I'm not of that faith. I'm of another faith. I'm an atheist. The book was written for mankind, and it reveals within our heart the things that are, that are lacking, and it shows us how we can make it right. God's Word provides real resistance. How do I live out my godly identity? Number one, avoid ungodly influences. Avoid ungodly influences. If that means you need to stop watching your television show that you love so much because it tempts you to do wrong, it makes you lust and think after a certain way, you know what you should do? Don't throw away the Bible. Don't get rid of church for your favorite television show. Turn off your t television show. Avoid ungodly influences. You need, there are some of you here today that need to go home and unfollow a whole bunch of people on Facebook. There are some of you that need to go home and unfollow a lot of friends on Twitter and Instagram because you're allowing other people to influence your heart against God and against his word. If you're going to continue to have that pop up on your feed, why do you think you have those thoughts? Why do you think that you are constantly entertaining sin when you're, when you're feeding it up to yourself? You need to un avoid ungodly influences. There, the Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. There are friends that you need to say, I am not going to hang out with anymore. Because they're a bad influence. It doesn't mean they're a bad person, but you do the wrong thing when you're around that person. Four corrupting influences, fashion and marketing, marketing industries. Uh, young people, you need to realize that, that, that all the things you see on TV and all the commercials you see have been very well thought through and they know just how to get to you. And some of you need to kind of waken up a little bit and, qu and quit kind of going with the flow and realizing there are people out there that are manipulating you. The fashion and marketing industry. Some of you have t-shirts that you should not be wearing with words that should not be said. Some of you are, are, are following people, are following fashion trends that are immodest and that are against God. 
You know what you need to do? You need, if you're going to live a life that is moral and pleasing to God and follows the absolute truth of the Bible, you need to un- avoid ungodly influences. You need to maybe hang out with some more Christians. You need to maybe follow Christians on Twitter, even maybe John Christ, the comedian. You need to follow people that will help you and will not, that will not appeal to your flesh. Avoid ungodly influences. I'll get, I'll get us out here. Two more points. Number two, how do I live out my God-given identity? Get rid of it ungodly influences. Number two, submit to biblical instruction. Submit to biblical instruction. If you cannot submit to your parents, you cannot submit to God. If you submit to your parents when they're around and you go and do your own thing when they're not around, you are not submitting to your parents. And if you cannot submit to your parents when they say clean your room, there's a really good chance you'll not submit to God when he says what you're doing is wrong. You need to submit to biblical instruction. Well, pastor, my heart says, it doesn't matter what your heart says. The Bible says your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what that means? No one knows it, not even you. You don't even know your own heart. Your parents know you inside and out, and they can read your face, they can read your motives, and you act like no one can can tell. They can look right through you. Your heart is desperately wicked. And many times your mom and dad know a whole lot better than you do on certain things. They might not know how to turn on the TV, but they sure know about morality. Submit yourself to biblical instruction. Number three, lovingly follow after Christ. Lovingly follow after Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. You don't belong to yourself, Christian. Paul says, I am a slave to Christ. He says, I am willing to bring all of my, all of my mental and emotional struggles under the authority of the one who died for me. Even if I want to do it, even if I'm... Uh, even if I have a compunction to do it, I am willing to not do it because of the one who died for me. Lovingly follow after Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christian, if you're not motivated out of guilt, maybe you'll can be motivated out of love. That Jesus Christ took on your sin upon his shoulders and died for you so that you could be uh, made right before God. Lovingly follow after Christ. Is it confusing? It's not. It's just hard. It's confusing when you try to follow after everybody's trend. And what we must do is lovingly submit our hearts to God. Who do you identify with? I'll tell you who you should. Identify with Jesus Christ. You want to to start a revolution? You want to start a new hashtag? Start a hashtag of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And see what kind of hate boils out of that. You want to be a revolutionary? You want to make sure that you have all the cool shirts that, 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 that express your political viewpoint? Why don't you be a revolutionary for Jesus Christ and have people make fun of you for it? Who do you identify with? Strip it all out. There's one person you should identify with, and that's Jesus Christ. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The piano is going to play here in just a moment. 